All right, so we're wrapping up our lesson on tithing. And um, I thought that we would take the principles that we've learned over the last three weeks, so we've looked through the scripture, and then build on them this morning with respect to uh, Christian giving now and how Christian giving sort of puts a, a capstone over this issue. So we'll talk about that today. And then any questions or any uh, issues that you want to discuss or any questions that you have, please feel free to email me or call me and we can talk about those. Uh, but give me some principles now. As we've done each of the weeks, I want to, again, the more that we repeat these things, the more that we go over them, the more that they'll be rooted and grounded in your memory and in your mind. Um, first of all, give me the, the texts that teach tithing before the Mosaic Law. Give me some texts that teach tithing that we see before the Mosaic Law. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, Miss Anya. <laughs> Okay, well, that's under the Mosaic Law. So Leviticus 27 definitely teaches us that... Yes. Yes, Genesis 14 and Genesis 28. So Genesis 14 with Abraham, very good. Genesis 28 with Jacob. Uh, we see an offering, if you will, or tithes starting uh, with uh, Cain and Abel in the garden. We drew some principles from that text. And so we see tithing taught before the Mosaic Law. We see tithing taught under the Mosaic Law, right? We looked at several, several of those texts a couple of weeks ago. And then last week, we looked at several texts in the New Testament. Remind me of some of those texts where the New Testament, yes. Yep, Matthew 23, we saw Jesus uh, not abrogating the tithe, but really upholding the tithe before his disciples and the multitudes that had gathered in his rebuke of the Pharisees. And we went through that. What's another pivotal text in the New Testament? with respect to tithing. Yep. Yes, Hebrews chapter 7. Very good. So Hebrews chapter 7. And Hebrews chapter 7 is sort of an exegesis on Genesis 14 and Abraham tithing to Melchizedek. So you keep these texts sort of in your mind and then what each of those texts teaches. But give me now some principles. We talked about crossing the principalizing bridge and deriving from those texts the principles that would apply to us in our day, in our context. Give me some of those principles that apply. Yes, it was an act of worship on the part of Abraham. Um, in that tithing to Melchizedek and then the text we looked at in Hebrews 7, there's also, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, an ecclesiastical hierarchy or a spiritual authority that you're tithing to. So yeah, we see that in that account with uh, Abraham and tithing to Melchizedek. Yeah, that brings up another really good point. It's that the Lord said it under the Mosaic law, didn't he? That um, the reason that he gave the tithe was to teach the people how to fear the Lord. Um, so with fear, there's a legitimate fear there. We don't want to disobey the Lord and draw God's displeasure, God's disciplining hand. So it's a le legitimate fear, but it also carries reverence, carries respect, carries a worshipful attitude. So yeah, tithing is a, a, a part of worship. Uh, it teaches us to fear the Lord. Um, what else can you think of principles that we drew from those texts? Don't be bashful. Yes. It's an act of faith. Very good. Just, and we saw that a lot in Jacob, didn't we, in Genesis chapter 28. Um, the Lord's going to do these things for me. He's going to bring me into my land, back into my father's house. Here's all the Lord is going to do for me. And because the Lord has promised to do these for me, I'm going to tithe. It's a, an act of faith in the Lord's promises that Jacob tithe. And we saw from that too, didn't we, from Genesis 14 with Abraham, Genesis 28 with Jacob, um, under the Mosaic covenant, and then even in the New Testament, how it's associated with God's promises that... Um, God, Abraham had made a vow with God and so tithe of all that he had, uh, that it spoils of war. Jacob, the Lord um, repeated the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob and as a result, in response to God's covenant with him, um, Jacob gave the tithe. And so the same thing under the Mosaic covenant. In light of the children of Israel being in covenant with God, they tithe, the Lord instituted the tithe uh, as a response to that. We have the same thing in the New Covenant with the church in response to our covenant with the Lord as an act of faith in the Lord, having done all these things for us, having give us, given us everything that we have. In response to that covenant, we tithe to the Lord, right? So it was always associated with the covenant. What are some other, yes?
Faith in God, yeah. He has an act of faith. Um, tithing was always a tenth, right? Pretty simple, straightforward principle. But we see that before the law, under the law, after the law, that tithing represented the tenth. Um, associated with the covenant, um, tithing was from the first or best. And we talked about that. A tithing was made to that that ecclesiastical authority, or that spiritual authority. And so that's where we get the idea that tithes come into the church in our day and age. That's the church. Um, it was never abrogated by the New Testament. So it's never taken away. And we saw in three different texts where it's talked about, two specific texts where it appears to be taught clearly. And so never abrogated by the New Testament and clearly taught by the New Testament. So the conclusion that we came to, and we'll get something out with respect to this so that you can... Uh, refer to it um, when you need to. Tithing continues for the Christian today. Tithing is commanded by the Lord for the Christian today. Now we took principles from the scripture to come to that conclusion, similar to, as we looked at, remember, um, the laws around divorce, uh, divorce and marriage, right? And we looked at that text in Matthew uh, 19 with respect to that. Uh, similar to the fact um, with, um, or not similar to foot washing, or to head coverings. We looked at the difference between the principles taught about tithing and the real principles behind foot washing or head coverings. So we made all those connections. So if tithing continues then for the Christian today, then here's an implication that we can draw from the New Testament teaching on giving. And here's where I want to go to today. Tithing then is the base or the foundation or the minimum then on which we build, the New Testament builds Christian giving, or the base or the foundation on which the New Testament teaches Christian giving. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Important points related to giving. We've learned the tithe, and the tithe specifically commanded by God, but in the New Testament, we have teaching on Christian giving. That teaching on giving, in the same way that the tithe is, is taught across different times and different contexts. We see giving throughout the Old Testament before the law. Where do we see giving before the law? Abraham. See giving with Adam, uh, Abel, Cain and Abel, right? Noah. So we see several examples before the law. We see giving under the law, above and beyond the tithe, don't we? Giving for what? You remember? Different things that the Israelites gave for? Gave for the poor? Yeah, yeah gave as an act of worship. What did they give toward? It wasn't, they weren't giving the tithe. There was giving above and beyond the tithe for the Old Testament under the law. Yes, Brenda. Yeah, building of the temple. They gave to the rebuilding of the temple. They gave the, to the rebuilding of the wall under Nehemiah. Um, so several things that the, the Israelites gave for above and beyond the tithe. And then we see Christian giving taught in the, the New Testament also after the law. And so teaching uh, in the New Testament leads us beyond the tithe into Christian giving, uh, tithe then becomes a minimum. And I want to look at several texts with respect to that. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 16. There are several texts in the New Testament that talk about giving. And here's a, an important principle to remember that although these texts are talking about giving, they're not talking about giving in place of the tithe. These texts assume the tithe and are now teaching giving for a specific purpose. And we see these specific purposes listed for us in each of the texts that we'll look at. Um, the tithe is assumed, if you will. The tithe has been commanded. It's a part of regular practice. Um, and then Christian giving is taught beyond that. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, look at verse uh, 1. And somebody read for us verses 1 through 4 nice and loud. Verses, hey, brother. Verses 1 through 4 nice and loud. Who's got that? Yes, thank you, brother. Okay, thank you, brother. So in verses 1 through here, now, someone might say that because this text uh, deals with giving and says nothing about tithing, then tithing must be done away with in the, in the church age or done away with in the New Testament. Um, it's not the case. And we're not to assume that because something isn't mentioned in the text that it's done away with. Um, 
that would lead us into a lot of error, all right? Tithing here is we've already established, you've got to keep these things in your mind, we've already established that tithing, taught before the law, under the law, after the law, because of all those good and proper principles that we looked at, it's an act of worship, it's an act of faith, the reasons that the Lord put it in place, all those things apply, and so the tithe here, even in the church at Corinth, is still applicable, the tithe is still going on. Here is a text where there is um, a necessity for the people to give above and beyond the tithe. Somebody remind me, uh, in Malachi chapter 3, when we look briefly at that text in Malachi, the Lord rebuked the children of Israel and was about to judge the children of Israel because they didn't bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. But what else were they not bringing into the storehouse? Tithes and offerings, right? Same principle here. Tithe becomes a minimum. Offerings or giving is above and beyond the tithe. So because this text, just because this text doesn't speak of the tithe, the tithe here is assumed. We're talking about something entirely different. Now, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 through 4, with respect to Christian giving, give me some principles that we can draw from this text. I want to do this the same way that we have done the other text so far. If you're going to do, uh, make observations on this text, you're going to do a Bible study on your own on Christian giving, and you're going to look at several texts with related to Christian giving. You want to make observations on the text and draw principles out of the text that relate to Christian giving. So give me some of those principles that you see in verses 1 through 4 here. Okay, so first day of the week. What, when does that tell you that they worshiped? Yeah, on Sunday. So this is, again, the church at Corinth is worshiping on Sunday, and they're to take um, tithes on the first day of the week when they come together for worship. So what does that tell you that giving here, the, the giving that they're going to take, what does that tell you that the giving is? Yeah, it's corporately, and it's an act of, it's a horrible way to ask that question, sorry. It's an act of worship. It's associated with their worship, right? So they're doing it corporately. It's associated with their worship. Their worship is on the first day of the week. And so, again, we see same principle, don't we? It's an act of worship. First basic principle, I guess you could draw, is that it is above the tithe. And if you haven't been able to be here for all three weeks, um, call me or email me. I'll get you those notes for the last three weeks. Um, the tithing issue is pretty clear in Scripture. Unless you come to um, these various texts with an agenda, then the, it's clear the Bible teaches tithing. It teaches before, under, and after the law. Uh, it's been pretty clearly established. So if you need help with that or you missed a couple of those lessons, let me know. Because when we get to Christian giving now, Christian giving is built upon uh, above the tithe, Okay. So it's an act of worship. It was to be collected on the first day, collected at worship. It's done corporately as an act of worship. What other principles do you see there? Yes. Okay, so it's for uh, saints, and here specifically a group of saints, right, that are in need. So uh, for saints in need, I guess we could put What other principles can you see there? Don't be bashful. <laughs> Pardon me? Very good. So as God has prospered. Explain what that means. Yeah. Yeah, so now God prospers in different ways, doesn't he? Um, has the Lord prospered Bill Gates? Yes. Um, does Bill Gates use what the Lord has given him for God's glory? Not necessarily. So, yeah, God prospers us in different ways. And so um, God may prosper you with great wealth, or he may prosper you with great poverty. Um, but as the Lord has prospered, where to give. Some of you are able to give more than others are you, of you are able to give. And when it comes to giving, you have the minimum of a 10% uh, obligation, so to speak. But above that, it really is, is according to what the Lord has given you. Uh, there are some that uh, you're just struggling to make ends meet every week. You've cut your expenses down to the bare minimum, and you're doing everything you can just to provide for your family and to give and don't have a lot left over. 
Um, there are others who have a lot left over and are able to give more. So we're to give as God has prospered, and that's for you to determine. Uh, that's between you and God. You've got to determine you're being faithful in that. What is an, what's another principle? Yes. We can go Ashley and then Rebecca. Yes. Yeah, personal responsibility. Very good. Did everybody get that? Personal responsibility. So let each one of you, each person has a responsibility to do this. So when a need arises, we are to think, am I able to give to this need? If you're able to give, then give. We each one have a personal responsibility to give. And so we're not to think. A need arises, well, I know my brother is going to give, so I'm, I'm okay not to give. Or I'll, maybe I'll get him on the next one because I know we'll have enough money from no, we have that kind of mindset. We don't collect what we need to collect. So let each one, you have a personal responsibility to give. And then you give, in your personal responsibility to give, you give as God has prospered you, right? Um, so yeah, personal responsibility to give. Very good. Yeah, very good. So it's regular in order to do that. Um, it needs to be planned, right? Which means that it's thoughtful. Um, we're to give spontaneously when a need arises, and there'll be needs that arise where you can just give spontaneously. But what's being alluded to here in verses 1 through 4 is a planned, thought out, um, determined amount. It means that you think to yourself, okay, you know, here's my budget. Uh, here's how much I know that I have left over. Here's what I think I can cut or not cut. And here's what I'm going to give. It's a determined action of your mind and your will in giving, right? It's not that you're going to, and listen, it's not that you're going to come and um, you know that at the end of the month, let's say, for example, um, with the income that I have, I have $100 of discretionary income every month that I can just do with whatever I want to do. And so a need rises up. You say, I'm going to give and I'm going to commit myself to $250, Okay, no, we can't. <laughs> it's as God has uh, prospered, um, and it's going to be thought out. It's going to be thoughtful. It's going to be planned. It's going to be considering what you're able to give. The Lord doesn't want you to be um, irresponsible with your money. He wants you to give as the Lord has prospered. Um, we'll see other principles here that talk about giving out of your poverty, even giving sacrificially. But if you don't have it, well, then you don't give it, right? <laughs> So it's going to be regular, planned, thoughtful. Very good. What are some other principles you see? Yeah, Robinson. Yeah? Yeah. Very good. So they've got a need, and someone from the church here, Paul specifically, and someone they designate, is going to take that collection and then go and deliver it, right? So there's a, a, an appointed person, I guess you could say to collect. And all this points to um, um, intentional, uh, the deliberate way in which they did it. Somebody else had a hand up. Yes, Ben. Okay, yeah, universal to the church is very good. And um, so you must do uh, commanded, right? Somebody else? Pardon me? Amen. Yeah, it's a priority. Very good. There to prioritize this. Something else? Yes. Clyde and then Jeffy. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, under this particular situation, it would have been. But um, there may be situations where you can give time, give resources, um, um, all kinds of ways to give, right? When somebody needs um, food, for example, we've got a food pantry, so it could be giving food. So yeah, very good point. It could be, I mean, in, in essence, with Christian giving, you're meeting a need, and you're meeting that in whatever way that you can. Well, you need food. I don't have money, so I can't. No, I can give you food. I invite you over to dinner. <laughs> you know? um, there's all kinds of ways that we can give. So yeah, very good point. Jeff, do you get one? Yeah. They're to lay it aside. Very good. So to be good stewards. Yep. 
Okay, we get the idea? Okay, so now these principles, you can note right off the bat too, a lot of these principles apply to giving in the same way that they applied to tithing. Uh, some of the same principles that we drew from those texts relating to tithing, we draw the same principles from these texts related to uh, giving. Um, okay, so again, principles there. Let's look at the next text, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Another couple of things, when it says uh, each of you, um, each of you uh, in 1 Corinthians 16 points to no one being excluded. So that each person, you know, each of you, so personal responsibility, no one excluded. Um, as God has prospered, proportionate giving, you know, proportionate to the, the way the Lord has blessed us, we're to give. But in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we have another example here. And again, through this whole chapter. And so what I th think we do, we'll do here is, um, let me read this first section, and then we'll just do the, the same thing. As we look through for principles, find principles in the passage that relate to giving that we can draw from the text. So it says in verse 1, for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, uh, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And so we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So that is a power-packed first you know, seven verses there. So let's take that one seven-verse chunk and do the same thing now. Think through as you're looking verse by verse, sort of clause by clause through this text. Give me some observations that you can make about Christian giving from... 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, motivated by God's grace. Okay, so that was very good. And it's interesting there that um, Paul uh, called giving a grace. Let me explain what that means. He says, abound in this grace also, Right? See that you abound in this grace also. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by calling giving a grace? Good then. <laughs> very good. Yeah, very, very good. And so, what grace might be dispensed from God through faithfulness in giving. I, I heard some initial, but I couldn't could, could make it out, Ben and then Rebecca. Yeah, so certainly to the people that you're giving to, like there's, that's the grace of God to them, right? The Lord uses the instrumentality of his people to edify the saints and to build them up. But what about, like to me personally, if I am faithful in giving, what grace from the Lord comes to me as a result of being faithful in giving? If I'm going to give, you know, above and beyond the tithe, Christian? Okay. Amen. So how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand to this, but how many of you have been um, the beneficiary of a gift? Like somebody provides something for you or gives something to you and the Lord has used that to bless you, right? And then think about how 
that caused in you worship to the Lord, right? Thank you, Lord. You know, just how the Lord is good to me. Yeah, Jesse. Good, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a big snowball effect in the church with, uh, yeah, <laughs> with loving and giving. But yeah, you've been blessed. So, um, I mean, the Lord provides for you. I, I, I've talked to brothers before that um, have attested, you know, the, the faithfulness of people in the church to give and how much we love one another. A brother will say, um, you know, I didn't know where I was going to get enough to, you know, have the next meal. Or I was short on my rent, or I was short on the electric bill, and a check shows up in the mail. Many times, uh, brothers and sisters talk about uh, how you... Um, you know, just put an envelope. Just an envelope shows up in the offering plate with someone's name on it. <laughs> and um, it's just a gift. Somebody just knows they're in need, um, knows they're having difficulty, and so gives to provide for them. And it's just a gracious gift. Um, and right, the Bible says don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing in that sense. You're not to trumpet or to you know, boast in your giving. Um, they just do it anonymously. And it's just a loving gift to a brother or sister in need. And that blesses that brother or sister. But now in the Lord's grace and mercy to us, when you give, when, we're, when you're faithful to give, how does that bless you? And that part to what Christian just said, you know, bolsters our trust in the Lord, bolsters our faith. Dorian? Yeah, yeah. In order to be faithful in that um, and not, we don't want to look at this like the prosperity teachers do. <laughs> you know, if you don't have the money, listen, put it on your credit card because God's going to bless you. <laughs> it's not the way that we're to go about this, but to Dorian's point, it's like we're to give abundantly, even out of our poverty, we're to give sacrificially. Um, maybe you'll agree with me in this. I've never, I've never given to help someone and at the end of the month, think to myself, oh man, I shouldn't have done that because you know, now I don't have enough for this or don't have enough. This just not happened. The Lord's always been gracious to provide. Um, so the Lord takes care of us in that. So yeah, good point, brother. Somebody else had their hand up, I missed? Yeah. Good morning, brother. <laughs> good to see you, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not going to become? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 And they were joyful in the middle of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it goes back to that issue of the grace that the Lord shows to us in faithfulness in this. You know, um, that's the thing. It, it's like any other means of, of grace. I, I've, I've thought about often how, you know, my own life, uh, evangelism, that uh, that person needs the Lord. They need to be saved. Um, they're going to go to hell if they don't repent and believe in the gospel and how desperate they are need to, to, to hear desperate in need they are to hear of Christ. Uh, they need the gospel. And yet what a blessing it is that the Lord gives to me 
when I evangelize, you know, faithfulness, it grows my faith. It grows me in his word. It makes me depend on him and trust in him um, for results of that. Um, just so many blessings that come to the Christian for faithfulness in these means of grace, and giving is no exception. Uh, when you give, and when you give sacrificially, we give joyfully, uh, you're going to be blessed by that. Um, the Lord, just as the way the Lord teaches the people to fear the Lord in the giving of the tithe, we learn to fear and trust the Lord and depend on the Lord in giving. Uh, he graces us with that. Our faith is bolstered when just time and time again the Lord provides everything that we need and just takes care of us in that. Um, there's great joy here when we just obey the Lord and we give to those in need. Um, so yeah, such grace to us as much as it is edifying to the, the saints. So what about some of those other principles then? Um, I've already mentioned, like uh, Ron just mentioned, uh, they gave uh, from their poverty, so giving was sacrificial. What are some other, um, they were joyful in giving. What else do you see there? Yeah, an example. So um, how would we word that? They were, um, they in themselves were being an example of, pardon me? Yes, yeah, so they're being commanded. They were, that was a, uh, there you go. Yeah, it was modeled. Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah it's a, we, um, it's part of the Christian life that we learn in the soil of suffering. And um, yeah, I, don't you remember that? When it's the, the lessons that are best remembered are those that were most difficult <laughs> to learn. It's those hard lessons taught are the ones you don't easily forget. What's that? Bought lesson, better than a told one. <laughs> yeah, very good. It's a wise grandmother. Uh, Jen? Yeah, amen. It's a model. Yeah, it's a model, not just model within the church, but model with the lost world, too. It's just such a good example. Very good. What else do you see there? Somebody else had their hand up? Yes. Amy. Yeah, very good. Yeah, amen. Yeah, all those things that, we're, that Peter says we're to abound in or to add to our faith. Now he's saying abound in this grace also. So what does it mean to abound in giving? Seems pretty straightforward, right? What does it mean to abound in giving? Is that? Yeah, do a lot of it, right? <laughs> so we're going to do abound in giving. We're to do a lot of it. TJ? Included in there, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Oh, gave to the Lord and then to us, gave them, gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's interesting that phrase um, can be taken that way, which is certainly true. Like the, the tithe would be giving to the Lord and then the giving of the offering above and beyond the tithe. It's almost that um, like. Uh, Paul says that um, he uh, obviously was giving them the word of God, but they poured themselves out also. It's like almost, you know, we pour ourselves out to God, and, but we were to pour ourselves out to one another also. So it's like they, because they gave themselves to the Lord, they poured themselves out for the Lord, uh, and then by the will of God gave themselves to us. Um, it's almost that, that, that idea of, you know, we become genuine Christians pouring ourselves out to the Lord, but in pouring ourselves out to the Lord, we're to become, as Paul says in Philippians, a, a drink offering to their service, a drink offering to the Lord in service to them. Um, so that's sort of what that means there. But, well, yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. So somebody give us an, uh, um, a definition of that. That how, how is this a fellowship of the ministering of the saints? What does that mean? Come on now. <laughs> yes, man. Now don't be bashful. You're also bashful. <laughs> Yeah, there's just something about that, right? It's like um, with a lot of other things. There's, there's, we obviously get a lot out of our personal devotions to the Lord, right? We read our Bible, we pray, we get great, great benefit to that, uh, from that. But there's something different about coming together and doing it, right? And we gather together on Sunday morning for worship. As special as that devotional time is, worship together, I can't forsake that. It's just a, a glorious time of brothers and sisters coming together and worshiping. Or um, there's something about, isn't there, evangelizing by yourself, which I've done many times, versus evangelizing with someone, like with a brother, or going out with the church, like when you gather at the parks or downtown, uh, or showing up on a Saturday morning, you've got everybody going together, right? There's just something uh, beneficial, something special about doing that together. Well, in the same way with giving, he's saying here, with the fellowship of the ministry of the saints, is that we're ministering to those in need, but um, there's a fellowship among the brothers and sisters doing that together, like corporately, um, there's something about the body of Christ coming together to, to do that. And if the body of Christ is gathered to do that and you're not, when you miss out on that fellowship, um, there's a fellowship of ministering together. Um, we've seen that in our own church, haven't we? Many times with many different things. Um, the joy of being a, a part of a church like this, um, could you be a fervent, you know, born again, following disciple of Christ at a church where there is no fellowship and is no corporate identity and all that kind of stuff, could you still be a fervent, you know, blood-bought, just 10, level 10 Christian at a church like that? Yeah, but is it, is something lost when you're doing that alone? <laughs> Isn't it so much better to come to a church like this where you're, man, your brothers are out evangelizing too and your brothers are learning from the word of God and your brothers are out evangelizing and your brothers are here to worship and your brothers are singing and pray, you know, praising the Lord and just something about the corporate aspect of that, isn't it? Well, he's equating the same thing to giving. Now, there's something about uh, our corporate identity as a church. When we do that, when we commit to that together, there's just blessing from the Lord in that. We're to be in fellowship with one another in ministering to the saints. And if you're here and you're not thinking of it that way, then you're missing out on that fellowship. Um, you know, we're, our church, we want our church to be seen by the Lord as fervently evangelistic, as biblically astute, as hating our sin and loving the word of God. We want the Lord to be pleased in our fellowship with one another, how we love one another. We want the Lord to be pleased in how we give as a church too, right? Uh, we don't want to be known as a stingy, ungiving church. <laughs> Corporately, we want to be seen in that fellowship together that we're a giving church. Someone has a need, that need gets met. And then people on the outside look at how they love one another. Um, so yeah, that's that fellowship of ministering to the saints. So all those principles, right? Yeah, Pete. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. giving from the heart, right? Instead of that heartless, ritualistic, uh, empty, um, you know, giving for the applause of men, you know, kind of a thing that the Pharisees were doing. Uh, this is, you know, truly from the heart. Ben? Oh, very good. Yeah. And isn't that um, uh, a testimony of their faith? Like somebody explained, why would that be a testimony of their faith that they looked at it that way? I think that's an important point. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like an opportunity to exercise faith, right? Is it, all the, the situation is so difficult. Um, really, really hard. We're in poverty. You know, we have nothing, but the Lord provides everything we need. And so by faith in God, it's just, um, 
I don't know, I can almost imagine them in 2 Corinthians 8 here being excited about the opportunity, joyful, said freely willing, joyful, being excited about the opportunity to give because, like to Ben's point, because they were in a trial of affliction. And we know the Lord is going to take care of us. And so you just, yeah, being joyful. It wasn't grudging. I mean, most of us, when we're having difficulty, it's like, oh, I got to give, but just, oh, this is not the right time. This couldn't have come at a worse time. You know, that kind of <laughs> attitude. But that wasn't describing them at all. It was like in the midst of their affliction, um, they were ready, free willing, joyful, um, jumping at the opportunity, biting at the bit to give as an act of faith in the Lord, trust in the Lord. Um, that's, yeah, just a good example, right? Somebody else had something? I missed a hand. Okay. Oh. And a lot of this too, they were, several of the churches were coming together. And so you had, um, you know, this church was to provide their part, but churches at Galatia were to provide their part. It was, they were all coming together to do their, to give their share, so to speak. And so together they would give what was necessary. Each individually might not have given enough, you know, and that's what, so corporately between the churches, they were all to come together to do their part so that they had enough for the saints in Jerusalem. But, um, Separately, there would have been lack, right? So it's almost like, you know, making up for if every church does their part and we've got enough to send. Jack? Yeah, amen. So in our giving, we're to exemplify or imitate Christ. Yes. So somebody help us with that. He says in verse 8, I speak not by my commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Yes. distinguishes it from the tithe, right? Tithe is something that would be commanded, uh, whereas that which is above the tithe, our gifts, our offerings, would be something that's between us and God at our, our sort of discretion. Andy? It's interesting, yeah, what is that in line with what Andy's saying? What is that phrase? Um, he's testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. What, would that, what does that mean there? Think about it maybe in terms of what Andy just said. He's testing the sincerity of their love by the diligence of others. You have to take a stab at what that is saying. That's why we're spending a little bit of time here, but these are good principles. Hey, Andy? You know, we have um, just another issue with uh, corporate fellowship in this sense, because we have great examples in the church. Um, you know, I, I, I could know, or I could gain, I can inform my own conscience or inform my own understanding but how, by how I watch, you know, Jack serve the Lord. Um, or I could inform my conscience or form my, inform my understanding of what it means to, you know, follow the Lord by how Robinson follows the Lord. You know, I could look at examples in the church. Um, 
and my chief example being Christ. So we have grace of the Lord in our church of faithful brothers and sisters, like Titus 2, right? Older women teaching younger women, older men teaching younger men, just faithful older Christians who um, provide us with examples to follow. And it's almost here Paul saying, um, testing the sincerity of our love by the diligence of others. And then he goes immediately into the supreme, supreme example of Jesus Christ. So we look at Christ's example and we test the sincerity of our own love. We look at what Christ gave and we test the sincerity of our giving. We can also do that with others in the church. We have examples in the church of godly men, godly women who provide us with examples of how to give and um, how to live the Christian life. And here, sort of testing their faith by the diligence of others is using their example, specifically the example of Christ in relation to how we give and it becomes a an examination of our own. And so we're, we're to do the same thing ourselves. Um, looking at all that Christ has given, do I need to hesitate to give? No. Look at all that Christ has given, uh, should I give abundantly or should I give begrudgingly? You know, abundantly. So we have an example in Christ and we also have the example of other faithful brothers and sisters in the church. Okay. All right. So far, so good? Okay. Let's continue then. And uh, yeah, in verses uh, 8 through 15, we see Christ's example there. Thank you, brother. Um, and look at verse 16. Uh, Thanks be to God, verse 16, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel, uh, travel with us with this gift, which is administered to us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. As we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner, fellow worker concerning you, or if our brethren uh, are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches of the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. And again, you know, evidence of faith there in verse 24, a proof of your love saying the same kind of thing um, in verse 8. But let's look now. The next text is, is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So just the following chapter here. And again, uh, principles that come from this. Um, look at uh, verse 1 in chapter 9. Uh, considering the ministering to the saints... It is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia, Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So what is he saying there? What should they be ashamed of? Yeah, Jack? Yeah, prideful giving, specifically here, um, yeah, he's given them a command to be ready, and so we should be ashamed, right, if they're not ready. Like if they've not given, if they've not prepared themselves, they haven't been thoughtful in that respect. So again, it goes back to this idea um, that we should be uh, prepared, that we should be thoughtful, um, that we should be doing this on a regular basis. It's shameful, isn't it? If a need comes up, and um, we have to, we give you time. We say, okay, we've got a benevolence need. We need to make a collection. Um, but we actually need to do that. So we need to do that again at groups this week. So there's an opportunity for you to uh, exemplify what this verse is teaching. We have a couple of benevolence needs, all right? So we're gonna take a collection for benevolence needs at groups on Tuesday and Wednesday, make sure that we've got enough. We started that last Tuesday. But um, in knowing that, if we came, not knowing that in advance, if we came on Tuesday or Wednesday and no one's prepared to give, is that shameful or not shameful? Shame, shameful. Well, we need to be prepared to give. Knowing that there's a need, knowing that we have benevolence needs that need to be met, um, we need to be ready and prepared to give. And so what he's saying is that if, if they're unprepared, it's a shameful thing to them. Be thoughtful, you know, be willing, be ready, be prepared to give when they come. Uh, and it tends to show if they're unwilling or not prepared, that it's a begrudging obligation rather than a willing, a free willing gift. He says that at the end, he says, uh, verse five, therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. See that? 
So again, this giving is a matter of generosity, not a matter of begrudging obligation. And you show that by your joy and your willingness in giving, your preparedness to give, your thoughtfulness in your giving. Uh, you show that it's a matter of generosity and not a begrudging obligation. So then he says this in verse 6, But I say this, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what is verse 7? Give me some observations from verses 6 and 7 that would apply to Christian giving. You know, on a, a side note, um, this is the way, you know, it's good to read your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible every day, just taking in a reading of God's Word so you can let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. But this is also the way that you study your Bible. If you're going to sit down and do a study of a passage of Scripture. You just want to sit down and begin to write out observations on that text. And so if you think about verses, let's say you're going to do a Bible study now on verses 6 and 7. Give me some observations that you would make from verses 6 to 7 about this text. Let me get, I had a hand over here first, and then Dan. Who was it that I missed over here? Did I cut off? Okay, Dan, you're up. Sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so explain that principle then, if we were to think about it then in terms of giving. Yeah, amen. Yeah, so we're not to specifically give uh, with an attitude of what's in it for me. I'm just going to give because of what's in it for me. Send us your $1,000 seed, you'll reap a $5,000 blessing, right? Kind of, a, kind of a thing. Not to think of it that way, but isn't it true that the Lord blesses when we're faithful? Um, that's also a sign of a right heart, and the Lord is concerned with your heart. If you so sparingly, what does that say about um, what does that say about your state of mind or your state of heart if you sow sparingly? Not, so not trusting God. You sow sparingly, what else? What's another indicator? What does sowing sparingly indicate about your heart condition? Yeah, you're a cheat, maybe you're a cheater, yeah. Maybe, yeah, something obvious is that. You may be a cheater, you know, you're, you're cheating. What else? What's that? Covetousness, yeah, it may mean that you're covetous. You're not willing to let go with my money, you know? Um, <laughs> Oh, have another master. Yeah, you may be serving your, the paycheck, serving money instead of serving the Lord. Very good. So all those things are, you know, when you sow sparingly, sowing sparingly, it's probably the fruit of a heart condition that's not, not good. And so when you sow bountifully, when you sow willingly with a cheerful heart, it, yeah, it's just the opposite, right? Like Dan's point, it's uh, showing a heart that's trusting in the Lord, that's uh, obviously being obedient to the Lord, fearing the Lord, because we're doing what the Bible says, giving us instruction here through the example to sow bountifully. Um, yeah, you recognize that all you have is the Lord's. You're to be a good manager of that. What else does, does sowing bountifully represent? What might that communicate about the condition of your heart? Leah? Yeah, esteeming others more highly than yourselves. Yeah, selfless. Very good. TJ? Amen. Yeah, very good. Something else? Yes. Gratefulness to God? Yeah, isn't giving a product of gratefulness too? Man, look at all the Lord has done for me. I want to give, you know? Yeah, praise the Lord. So that, yeah, that's a very good point. Some, another observation from verses six and seven there. Yeah. 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 Very intentional. Yeah. You know, I, I had heard um, a story, it uh, hadn't been that long ago, about a, a couple, it was a true story, a couple who, uh, this ministry was getting started in California, a false teacher, and the false teacher was, um, you know, calling people, asking people to get, who was in his church before, and I was planning this big church in California, 
um, sell everything that you have and move to California and, um, you know, basically live in a tent and worship with me, you know, their false teacher. And so this family did that. Uh, they sold everything that they had. They, you know, basically bought some camping gear, took off for California in their van to go live on the false teacher's compound, you know, and they obviously gave everything to him. He completely squandered all of that. And the family uh, went into bankruptcy. The man could no longer provide for his wife or his kids or his household because he had given everything to this false teacher. Now, he thought the guy wasn't a false teacher, obviously. But what, you know, if, if you, if being unwise about giving that way or just, you know, not being thoughtful, not being prepared, not being well planned out, what principle or what command did that man violate by giving everything to the church, so to speak? What other principle did he neglect? What other command did he did he violate? Yeah, Ben? Yes. So yeah, if you don't take care of your own household, you're worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. And so yeah, if, you, if you're not, to Lee's point, if you're not being uh, faithful and not being wise and not being thoughtful and not being prepared in your giving, then you could put yourself in a situation where now, as a result of your negligence and your you know, imprudent behavior, you're not taking care of your own household. We're not, to, we're not to give to the point that way. The Lord doesn't expect that. The Lord doesn't expect that you give to the point where you can't take care of your family. Um, you take care of your family. Now, does that mean that you say to yourself, well, my family needs direct TV. And, uh, you know, 10 channels is not sufficient. We need 1,000 channels, all right? So I'm just going to be unable to give anything because I've got to be able to pay for it. Right. I mean, this is uh, the Christian and is between that person and God are supposed to think biblically and think wisely about these things and then give appropriately. So very good. What other principles real quick from, yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah. Very good. So explain that to us. What is he saying there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, amen. So now that, that requires... That requires that every person does their share. And so that's what the scripture said earlier. Um, and if we all do our share, then that, that person that has more to give is going to make up for my lack if I have less to give or vice versa. But we've got to all do our share. Um, what does that remind you of? Pardon me? Yes, definitely serving the widows. We've got to be faithful to that, Sergio. That's not quite what I'm getting at yet, TJ. No, not quite. I'm, I'm doing a bad job of asking questions today. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different track, brother, but I appreciate the, the input. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, but that is true. So thank you, brother. For <laughs> I was thinking about the gifts in the church. I'm just not with it today. Yeah, you know, the Lord, the Lord gifts each one um, to specifically employ their gifts in the church. And so where I may have one gift, another person has another gift, those gifts are the Lord puts together to be for the benefit of the body, to be compatible. And, but every person has to do their share in employing their gifts. Sort of the same thing with, with giving in the church. The Lord gives to people in various ways. But, and according to how God has prospered you, you're to give. And so that when we all do our share, no one lacks. It's interesting in the Old Testament with Israel, oftentimes when they give, the Bible records that they gave more than was necessary. They actually had to stop the giving because the people gave so much and they had more than what they needed. Yes. Everybody had need, yeah. So yeah, the Lord just works that way. All right, 
we're out of time, but thank you guys so much. And uh, hopefully that's been helpful. Uh, we'll get a little position paper out here soon that'll explain all that. And if you have questions, again, let me know. So let's pray and get back to worship. So Father in heaven, uh, thank you for this time together. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for your word again and how clear it is on instructing us. And help us, Lord, not to be um, negligent in this grace of giving, um, but to fellowship with one another in ministering to the saints through faithfulness in giving. Uh, knowing, Lord, too, that that's a means of grace that you used to edify and build us up and build us up in the faith and conform us into the image of Christ, who is our great example. So help us in these things and help us not to be negligent. And when there's uh, a need, uh, let us not be ashamed in how we respond, uh, but let us be faithful to you and take joy in that. Uh, our boasting is in the Lord, uh, Lord, all that you've given us. And we're just grateful to you for all that we have, uh, all that you provided for us. And so we want to give back to you as an act of worship, as an act of faith in trusting you, Lord, and just joyfully um, knowing, Lord, that Christ, our great example, gave all for us. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.